Hello and welcome to the September 2022 Recreational Astronomy Night Meeting Online Edition of the RASC Toronto Centre. My name is Paul Markov, coming to you from Markham, Ontario. And um, our next meeting in October is full. However, I am always looking for speakers for future meetings. So uh, I'm looking for presenters for the uh, November and later meetings. If you have something in mind, please get in touch with me. And as a reminder, our meetings are currently being held on the first Wednesday of each month. Uh, before we start the presentation, I would like to thank in advance our top-notch uh, technical team, uh, which includes uh, Andrew and Betty Reed, Ward Grow, uh, Emma Seabrook, and Ennio Cellucci. Thank you guys for making these presentations possible. Um, we have uh, three presentations um, this evening, as we, we always do. Um, our first presenter is uh, making his debut, presenting the sky this month, uh, Claudio Oriani. And uh, then we have uh, Benjamin Law, uh, and he'll talk to us about astrophotography in the city. And finally, uh, Frank Dempsey will talk to us about his recent merry-go-round observatory project. Uh, our president, Tom Luton, will wrap up the meeting with announcements as usual. If you have any questions for our speakers, please enter them in the YouTube chat box and Emma will ask your questions uh, to the speaker on your behalf. And if you're attending the meeting for the first time, uh, whether you're a member or not, please uh, say hello and let us know where you're from, also in the chat box. So let's get the meeting started with uh, Claudio and the Sky this month. Thank you, Paul, for having me tonight. Uh, hello, everyone. That's Claudio Rian here from Richmond Hill, working this sense with the David Dallop Observatory. Tonight, I will talk about the sky this month, specifically between today, September 7th, and October 5th, 2022. Note that during my presentation, all the times are expressed in the Eastern Daylight Time, which is four hours behind UTC. There's a lot going on this month, so without further ado, let's start. A glimpse. So in a few days, this Saturday, we have the harvest moon on September 10th. Then two planets, plus an asteroid, will reach opposition. So Neptune will be in opposition on September 16th. Jupiter will reach opposition on Monday, September 26th. So they will be at their closest. We also have a fall equinox on Thursday, September 22nd. And by the way, this is one of the best time of the year to see the zodiacal light. That is a triangular diffuse globe of light made by interplanetary dust. For the northern hemisphere, it will be visible to the east of the pre-dawn sky. Around the equinoxes is when the ecliptic is at a steepest angle against the horizon and is visible higher in the sky. So to better view and photograph the zodiacal light, find the spot from far from the light below the sky. Um, Mars and Uranus will rise just before midnight, surrounded by the winter stars, Aldebaran, Hyades, Pleiades, and we have no major meteor showers, but keep an eye on the southern taurids that usually they're not very active. Um, they active between September and mid-November, but the good thing is that uh, even though they have a peak of five meteors per hour, however, there is a high proportion of these meteors can be very bright fireballs. So keep an eye. So astronomical uh, sunrise at sunset. So today sunrise was at 6.48 a.m. at sunset at 7.42. So we have almost 13 hours of daylight. While October 5th, we only have 11 hours and 31 minutes of daylight. That means that the daylight is shortening by one hour and 23 minutes. Good news for uh, astrophotographers. The astronomical twilight, so astronomical twilight uh, today ends at 9.22 p.m. And um, so we have uh, technically seven hours, 47 minutes of imaging times. But on October 5th, the astronomical twilight ends at 8.26 p.m. and starts at 5.45 a.m. This means that we have uh, nine hours and 19 minutes of imaging time. So we gain one hour, 32 minutes of imaging time. The sky. So summer triangle is very high in the sky around 10 p.m. at the beginning of this month. The Big Dipper is going very low on the northern horizon. And fall constellations are replacing summer constellations in the sky. 
So you will see Sagittarius setting early in the evening, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, Auriga, Taurus rising on the northeastern horizon. And Mars will meet Aldebaran, they are both red in Taurus, so it's an interesting combination. So I will show you a few a screenshots I took from Stellarium, the software that is free. So tonight, um, if you look at the southern sky, you can see the moon and Saturn very close in Capricornus. And uh, as I said before, the Sagittarius is a setting. While if you look to the eastern, southern horizon, so you will see Jupiter and also Neptune rising later. Jupiter is a closer to a position, is the brightest um, in the sky. If you look northwest, you will see, as I said, you know, Perseus, Cassiopeia, Andromeda, they're rising. And if you are up, up to 5 a.m. tomorrow morning, you will see Orion and Pteritol, Auriga, Gemini, and so on. While at the end of the month, beginning of October, you will see that the Pleiades will be higher and higher in the sky. The Sun. Sun is approaching its maximum activity for the solar cycle. So the solar cycle, also known as the solar magnetic activity cycle, is a sunspot cycle or and the nearly periodic 11 year change in the sun's activity measure in terms of variation of uh, its magnetic field, the number of uh, several sunspots, and possibly uh, northern lights. Northern lights can hit our uh, magnetic field. Usually, they are very visible in the northern um, latitudes. But uh, if you keep an eye on this uh, website I listed here, so spaceweather.com or the NOAA, Dot com also apps for smartphone my aurora forecast that are both available for android and ios keep an eye because uh, you can uh, have surprises uh it was uh, probably a couple of months ago i didn't see with a naked eye but just in the park so in a very light polluted sky i was able to take some picture of uh, you know blinking uh, green uh, northern lights so it's uh, worthwhile to have a look the moon the moon will be at closest just tonight. Actually, it was a few hours ago. And uh, the apogee will be on September 19th. So the minimum distance is today. And the maximum distance is on September 19th, as you can see here. While the phases, so the full moon will be this next Saturday. So no good news for you know um, those who are imaging uh, deep sky objects, but Keep an eye on the moon. And this full moon is named Full Harvest Moon. Um, this is happening near the fall equinox, so on September 22nd or September 23rd, and always takes the name Harvest Moon. Unlike other full moons, this full moon rises at nearly the same time for several evenings in a row, uh, about 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes for Toronto latitudes. And this makes more time for, you know, allowing... Uh, finishing their harvest for farmers before the frost of fall arrives. So the last quarter will be on September 17. The new moon will be on September 25th. So keep an eye and uh, take images and go out. Even the moon is beautiful. And the first quarter moon will be on October the 3rd. Libration. So I took this image from uh, earthsky.com this is the link and the funny thing is that we can see technically more than 50 percent of the moon the moon is always facing the same side to us but since there is a um, gravitational attraction from the earth and also the orbit of the moon is an ellipse so the moon is like uh, wagging and waving and we can see from time to time more than 50 percent technically 59 percent of the moon surface sometimes we can see more than north limb like uh, tomorrow 
Sometimes you can see more on the eastern limb, so it will be on September 13, and sometimes the southern limb, most exposed on September 27. The western limb is out of uh, this presentation, but is also visible from time to time. The moon and the planets, uh, they are creating interesting uh, uh, photo opportunities this month. So first, it will be moon and Saturn, very close in the sky tonight, tomorrow, and on September 9. We'll uh, show you in a while. Then moon and Neptune will be very close on September 10. Then moon and Jupiter will be close on September 11, unfortunately in daytime, but you can see them even uh, the previous and the following days. And then Moon and Mars will be close enough on September 16, and it will be a very, very good photo op. Again, from Stellarium, you can see tomorrow the Moon and the Saturn quite close in the sky, four degrees. The red um, rectangle is what a camera, uh, in that case, my Nikon D5300 um, with a Nikon. 18 millimeter lens can capture in the sky. So if you have uh, a nice view of your horizon, some uh, background, uh, interesting thing to capture, keep an eye and try. Then uh, on Neptune, um, Jupiter on September 10, so the full moon will be positioned just three degrees below Neptune and Jupiter will be on their left. On September 11, the moon again meets Jupiter and Neptune. If you see from the previous slide, you can see the moon is moving. And this is happening around uh, 10, 15 p.m. Then again, moon and Mars will be very close on September 16. And this is a very good photo opportunity because you can see moon, Mars, and also the uh, Pleiades and Aldebaran. So that's interesting to capture. And now let's go to the planets. Mercury is visible technically in the evening sky at the beginning of September, but will be very, very close to the sun and the inferior conjunction will be on September 23rd. So the apparent size of the disk of Mercury will increase to 10.4 arc seconds on September 21st, but it will be pretty impossible to see, and also dangerous because it's very close to the sun, so don't. And the beginning of October instead, it will be the best morning apparition for the year for the Northern Hemisphere Observer. And this will be the appearance just before sunrise on October 5th. So Mercury will be here, high in the sky. Venus. Venus uh, is uh, still bright in the morning, but uh, since uh, its distance is just 10 degrees uh, to the sun on September 15 and 6 degrees by the end of the month, this will be very hard again, too close to the sun. So be very careful if you try to capture Venus. Mars finally is rising before midnight as September begins. So we are getting ready for the opposition that will be in November. And by the way, for Toronto Latitude, there will be opposition plus a full moon will occult Mars. So it will be very interesting. So let's hope for a good weather. Anyways, on September 9th, it will pass again. Four degrees north of Aldebaran is interesting to see the, call, the red color of uh, Mars and uh, the star Aldebaran in Taurus. And uh, the apparent size will increase uh, to 12.3 arc seconds on October 5th. If you observe a small telescope, Mars will show a very gibbous phase and some of the most prominent details on the surface, such as Sirtis Major, the polar cap will be also visible. If you try this tool from Sky and Telescope here, you can see for your location, for the um, time you will input, what you can see in Mars. Try it and let me know if it works. Jupiter. Oops. 
Opposition will be on September 26, so get ready. It will reach you know, the minimum distance to the Earth, so it's a 33 light minutes. It means that it will be um, 3.95 astronomical units from us. The magnitude will be this maximum, two point, minus 2.9, and the size will be almost 50 arc seconds in Pisces. The distance from the celestial equator is only one arc minute, and this is very interesting because it's much higher in the sky compared to the last Jupiter position. It means less air masses. What means? This means that the air mass is the amount of air that you are looking through. If an object is low to the horizon, like 10 degrees, it's like 5.6 air masses. So it's wobbly, like looking through a glass of water. If it's 90 degrees to the zenith, it's only one air mass. So take advantage of Jupiter moving from the southern skies. And again, uh, from time to time during the month of September, the little round shadows of uh, the four Galilean moons uh, will cast on uh, Jupiter's disk. And every two or three nights, the great red spot will be also visible. Uh, you can see the event of the transit online on this website and also on the Observer Handbook, if you have it. Page 2026 20, to, um, to 230. Saturn. Uh, last month was Saturn opposition, and Saturn is uh, quite low in evening sky in Capricorn. It's interesting because Saturn is uh, moving in retrograde motion, so our planet uh, surpassed Saturn. So Saturn's uh, upper motion is going backwards, and it's going against the fourth magnitude star, Yota Capricorn. Uh, the diameter will uh, be 18.6 six uh, arc seconds on September 7th, so tonight, but with the uh, rings, uh, it will be interesting to see. Um, the distance is uh, 1.3 million kilometers. So we are looking always back in the past. If Jupiter is only 30 minutes away from us, Saturn with the speed of light is uh, one hour and 15 minutes. On October 5th, this magnitude will uh, be 0.5. And the distance will be 76.9 light minutes. It's going far away from her. Other interesting thing, so the Saturn's ring will narrow every year until spring of 2025. So we'll be able to see the southern part of the rings because of uh, the inclination of uh, Saturn orbit. Uranus. During September, um, Uranus will uh, um, rise uh, in late evening and uh, moving slowly eastward through the start of the southwestern areas. Uh, on September 14, uh, there is an interesting opportunity for uh, those who live in the northern, on, northernmost Canada because uh, Uranus will be occulted by the moon. This will happen again uh, the next month. Neptune. Uh, by the way, I took this image of Neptune on August 13 with my Celestron 8, schmidt Cassegrain, a dedicated planetary camera, JWO, ASI 224MC, and 2.5 power mate. What this image shows, it shows Neptune, the blue disk of Neptune, and a moon triton. So this time of the year is the best to see if you have at least a six or eight inches diameter telescope to try to spot or photograph the brightest moon of Neptune, Triton, which is mag maximum magnitude for this year around the time of opposition. And the disk of Neptune on September 16 will be four light hours. So it's uh, like a 28.9 astronomical unit. Well, an astronomical unit is uh, the average distance uh, between the sun and our planet in Aquarius. Comets and asteroids. So technically, we can still see the comet uh, C2017 K2 Pan stars in Scorpius after sunset. 
but it's very uh, hard because uh, um, it will be video just after sunset, just 12 degrees above the horizon. I for a while to have a look um, on a few websites. Like I will show you uh, in a while. But uh, Juno, the Acer Juno will be in opposition on uh, September 7. So tonight, his money will be 7.7. .7. Also, take a look. Uh, another comet will uh, be in the news in the next few months because uh, it can potentially be visible to the naked eyes on February 2023. And the comet is C2022 E3 in Hercules. Right now, the magnitude is not that bright. It's 12.6, but uh, it already has uh, an interesting um, tail. So try to keep a look. Um, and about asteroids, there is a planetary defense mission, DART, will impact on an asteroid on September 26. And the interesting thing that this asteroid is a double asteroid. So there is the asteroid name Didymos, but its moonlet, Dimorph Dimorphos, will be hit by this um, planetary defense mission on September 26. And this is a website to follow. <coughs> so this is the comet C2017 K2 Pan Stars tonight. So it's hard to see, but try to have a look. Uh, this magnitude is uh, probably 8.8, .8, so it's quite hard to see. And this is the other comet. So the link I was mentioning before, you can see the new comets and also the bright comets is uh, here on the bottom of this slide. astro.vanbuitenen.nl slash new comets. Juno position is tonight in constellation Aquarius and its magnitude is 7.8. It's easier if you look with a small telescope. Deep sky suggestion for the month of September. Um, again, I will take advantage of this object when they are higher in the sky, less air masses and less affected by the atmospheric dispersion. So my personal list, uh, for the most part, are objects in uh, Cygnus, Vulpecula, and uh, the little fox and um, Aquarius and Pegasus. So they are Messier 27, the Dumbbell Nebula, the Crescent Nebula in Cygnus, the Veil Nebula, the North American Nebula, NGC 7000, and two beautiful globular clusters, Messier 2 and Messier 15 in Aquarius and in Pegasus. Also try to uh, use this free online planning tool, uh, https uh, telescopius.com is a free and you can uh, just input your latitude and longitude and we'll see what you can see with your uh, telescope. You can decide whether to look at the galaxies, uh, globular clusters, on open clusters and so on. So this is the Dumbbell Nebula, and this is uh, another image I took uh, a few weeks ago with a dedicated camera, um, a narrowband filter, with a small refractor, 80 millimeter diameter. Again, this is uh, the Crescent Nebula in uh, Cygnus. Uh, it's an emission nebula, and uh, there is a star that is uh, uh, in the middle of this nebula that is uh, just emitting uh, and uh, brightening uh, the gas. And you see 6888. This uh, image has been taken on July 2020, 2022. The Veil Nebula, again, is uh, um, a supernova remnant that is located in Cygnus. There are different parts. So it's uh, also called uh, Cygnus loop, and there are so many pieces. So this is the western part to the left, and the other image on the right is the eastern part, also known as the Witch's Broom Nebula, and it's located here in Stellarium. So this is Deneb, but this is the, uh, you know, the north part of the Cygnus, and the, the nebula is here. 
you will uh, need to use again an urban filter. Um, and I, interesting that you can see the red part is uh, hydrogen, alpha, and the green and blue part is oxygen. So we are technically made of uh, supernova remnants. NGC 7000, also known as the North American Nebula. This uh, image has been uh, um, shot on August 2022, and is on the other part, so just close to Deneb, the brightest star of Cygnus. While I didn't take pictures this year, I will add them to my uh, library soon, hopefully. The globular cluster in Aquarius, M2, it's here, it's north of Saturn, where Saturn is now, so it's quite high in the sky. And Messier 15 in Pegasus will be rising to the eastern horizon. So it will be interesting to capture in the next few weeks. Let's go to the International Space Station. So all the information here is uh, captured from Evans Above a website. Again, you have to input your latitude and longitude for your location. And you have to check from time to time because uh, maybe there are micro corrections. There is a new uh, SpaceX mission. And, uh, you know, the International Space Station can have uh, some orbital correction go up and down. So it can change from time to time for a few seconds. So the brightness, um, for example, if you go on the September 9 or September 10, it will be minus 3.8, the best, the brightest. It will be in the morning, 5.44 or 4.56. And the maximum altitude for the September 10, so sign this date, is 82 degrees to the horizon. So it will be very bright in the sky. And then it will switch to the um, evening sky on September 13. You will see 848. It's not particularly clear, but you can always see the International Space Station. Again, uh, this is uh, for the next few days. For now, keeping an eye on September 15, September 17. September 18 will be minus 3.8 and so on. If you click on the links to the left, they're blue where the date is, you will see a map on where the International Space Station will be visible. And this is for the end of the month. Also interesting to see uh, this other website, um, transit-finder.com, when you can see from your uh, location, if the International Space Station or the Tiangong, the Chinese Space Station, will transit over the moon and the sun for your location. Obviously, never look directly at the sun. You will need a specific solar filter. For the moon, it's better. Uh, what I see for my location, that potentially I can see the Tiangong uh, transiting over the sun on September 12 and September 15. They're forecast for my location. Space exploration. There is lots going on here. So September 10, there is a Starlink. I don't like them particularly because they will, you know, brighten the nice sky. And when I'm taking a picture of, uh, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of object, I will see, you know, trails of uh, Starlink. Uh, but I understand that, you know, uh, for internet satellites, this is important. Uh, I will um, go rather to the Artemis one. Probably this will be one of the questions I will be asked. So, as you know, there were two attempts and they were scrapped. So teams, NASA teams decided to repair a seal between the mobile launcher and the rocket that NASA Kennedy's last launch pad, 39B. NASA is continuing to review options for the next launch attempt. However, to meet the current requirements by the Eastern Range for the certification, the flight termination system, as such would, NASA would need to roll the rocket and spectra back to, to the uh, vehicle assembly uh, building before the next launch attempt to reset, reset the system batteries. 
So um, lots of going on. There were, uh, you know, engine cooling issues and uh, a leak of hydrogen. There will be a uh, few missions to uh, the International Space Station. So September 21st uh, from Baikonur, there will be um, the Soyuz. And I believe there is also, uh, again, this is a, another uh, mission, the Starship from SpaceX. There will be, to be defined, it can be September or it can be later this year. We don't know yet. So keep an eye. Anyways, um, there will be Falcon 9 with other uh, Star X, Starlink uh, internet satellites. And uh, on October 3rd, there will be a Falcon 9. The Crew 5 will reach the International Space Station. How did I get all this information? The website is here, spaceflightnow.com slash launch hyphen schedule. And that's uh, pretty much it for me. If you have any questions, uh, I'm here. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio. You did a great job uh, doing the uh, Sky this month. Uh, and uh, I think I'll uh, reach out to you for future presentations like this. Um, let's go to questions. Emma, do we have any questions for Claudio? So, nope, we didn't get any questions tonight for Claudio. No questions. OK, well, uh, Claudio, sounds like you covered everything very well. All right, uh, let's move on to our next speaker, and that's uh, Benjamin Law, and uh, he'll talk about astrophotography in the city. Go ahead, Benjamin. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. And first of all, really thank RESC for inviting me to speak tonight about my biggest interest, uh, which is astrophotography. Um, uh, I'm, I consider myself as an um, amateur astrophotographer. That means I'm not doing this for, for a living. I'm just doing this for interest. And uh, in the last presentation, I've seen a lot of useful information uh, that you know anyone can actually try to do some shots. Now, so my topic uh, tonight is about astrophotography in the city. Um, personally, I live uh, north of Markham, but not not really in Markham, in a town called Stouffville. But uh, because of the you know the, the a lot of people migrate to Markham and and maybe Stouffville, the sky is actually very 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 bright, and there's been lots of um, uh, light pollution there. So a lot of people ask me like, how did you take these photos, um, kind of like in in the city sky? And uh, this is why I wanted to share with all of you um, some of the some of the ideas that how to take photos in the city. In order to connect to my journey in astrophotography, uh, I think we need to go back to a little bit to my background. Um, I've been intrigued by a few very interesting celestial events when I was in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, as you probably know, it is a big metropolitan city with, back in that time, it has like 6.5 million people uh, in a very small place. So um, the sky is actually literally lit up all, all day long. Um, so in the early 80s, um, there were uh, a few interesting celestial events that I actually missed personally as a kid. I remember there was a solar eclipse um, there was a planetary alignment. I just saw it from the news. And uh, of course, uh, many of you could probably remember Halley Comet. Uh, it was a big thing in the 80s, uh, but uh, I, I, I personally, I missed it. But I was intrigued so much by all these interesting events that happened in the sky. And I developed my, my hobby in astronomy. So this is the... The first telescope my, my dad got me in the early 80s, it is a Tasco Bert Jones Newtonian. It is a toy quality level, um, entrance level telescope. And you may think, wow, well, what is this scope going, going to give you? The first target I saw from this three inch telescope was actually Saturn. I still remember vividly how that felt when you look at Saturn's ring, 
through the telescope, like in front of your eyes. It was a very, very, very good like feeling, and and I'm surprised like how much you know I, I can at least I can see the ring through a very very small scope, and um, in the early nineties I, I I still have a lot of interest in astronomy, and I actually spent about nine months time uh, making my own telescope, and uh, this is a four point five inch. Uh, refractor telescope and it's actually coming from two pieces of round glasses and you ground it grind it with a special way and and after many many weeks about nine months I spend maybe a couple of hours every week about nine months time I, I brought it to a factory to coat a layer of uh, aluminum for me and here we go there was the first telescope that I and first and only telescope that I ever made and my parents supported me in this hobby initially, probably because they saw this. I don't know if you have seen this meme on, on social media, but uh, yeah, um, this hobby sometimes it is uh, uh, relatively pricey, but uh, you know, I, I think, you know, in terms of optical instruments, if you keep it well, it lasts forever. So telescopes, like, like very old telescope, if you keep it well, you can actually pass it from generations to generations, or even you can, you can sell it for, with, a, with a very good price. So the depreciation, depreciation rate for a, a good telescope is actually um, not that much. So uh, in 1992, when my parents and I arrived in Canada, uh, we, we saw, wow, such a beautiful sky. Right and and um, so my dad got me the Super Polaris Celestron Super Polaris C8 telescope. That was my first official, like observational telescope, and I was so happy. And I kept it for many, many, many years. And I I, I think I sold it like a few years ago. And my interest in astronomy grew and grew, but not really get into astrophotography until. My twin boys turned five, and until my daughter turned seven. Think about when you have three kids running around in your house, and you probably want to find find ways <laughs> to, to, to get away from the house. And I think doing astrophotography is my uh, getaway, like, at least just in the backyard. But I didn't go anywhere far. So I started with a DSLR, just a digital camera with a tripod. And then I started connecting my DSLR to my Super Polaris uh, C8. And uh, so that was my starting journey of astrophotography. Um, just like any astrophotographer, you probably know that, well, it was a very difficult process. And at the beginning, I really had no clue. This is the kind of like the first, well, not imaginary. I actually set it up and I took a photo and don't do this. This is totally wrong. You can see that you know this guy's scope is not really guiding, and it is too far away from the scope. The center of mass here is too high. You have to put multiple weights here, and this mount is not supposed to hold up this much weight for astrophotography. So that this is just a wrong example. Learning curve in astrophotography is really, really steep. I think a lot of people would be. Uh, uh, agree that you know it is a very steep learning curve. Anything can go wrong from a piece of cable, from the software you're using, from um, um, you know guiding, focusing, polar alignment, exposure. Uh, sometimes I identify the wrong target for the whole night uh, because they're so dim. Uh, deals, bugs, anything you can imagine, especially this. When the cloud is basically following your target, that is very, very frustrating. And it happens all the time. When you look at the forecast, it's like perfectly clear for the whole night. And all of a sudden, the cloud just following your targets and you, you just have to give up. There are lots of moments like this. So that's why uh, the learning curve is very steep. You have to deal with frustrations all the time. Some of the early, some of the photos in my early stages I, I want to share with you. This is Andromeda uh, M31. And uh, this one is the Whirlpool Galaxy M51. Um, you know what? I was pretty happy. 
at the beginning of my uh, astrophotography stage, those are like golden memories because every astrophotographer will have to go through this stage. Maybe you and I have different stage. Some of you may be so much more advanced than I do. And some of you may be at the beginning stage, but we're all at a different stage. We just need to keep working on it. Um, this is Bode's Galaxy. Um, and this is this one on the right, I believe is a pinwheel M101. I have a better version for the pinwheel in a moment to share with you. And after many trials, I found some turning points in this hobby. Few turning points I want to mention. First of all, I read a lot of articles online. I speak to a lot of people online um, um, because this hobby, honestly, is very lonely. <laughs> like you, none of my friends in my social group doing the same thing, and I only know people online, like the cyber friends that are doing that. Uh, so you have to speak to people online. And I realized that, hey, maybe I can modify my DSLR because a traditional, uh, 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 so we, what we call the stock camera, there is a, a filter that can actually block out a lot of very useful information from stars and nebula. And when they block that, you know, especially the hydrogen alpha spectrum, um, the effectiveness of your photo would be much lower. Even though, yes, if you don't modify your camera, you can still uh, take some photos of nebula with a lot of lots and long integration time. But um, if there's a way to do that, and it is free because that is just my DSLR sitting around and, and I don't think I'm gonna use it for any daytime photography because I have my phone. <laughs> my phone camera can actually do a lot better uh, daytime photography. So I decided, hey, let's modify it. So how do I do that? YouTube is a good friend. There are many, many tutorials on YouTube that can just, you just follow this step by step. Um, the YouTube video that I followed is using exactly the same model of camera that I'm using, the Canon T5i. So I just follow that step by step, screw by screw. I think I spent maybe one hour, one hour and a half, and I took out the filter and put it back. And that was good because after that, many of the nebula, photos with um, nebula is just so much more vivid. Another turning point I want to mention is that I realized the mount is so important in astrophotography. Um, many of uh, people started this hobby, they try to go for like high-end scope or big telescope, but um, I think in my experience, um, the quality of the mount is the most important thing because when your stars can be tracked and guided nicely through a higher quality mount that means the mount should be able to handle uh, a, a, a more payload uh, that means that how much weight you can put on put on right here in your in your telescope uh, the position for the telescope and um, if you have a higher payload that means you have a more stable um, system. The more stable it is, the better the picture you will get. Sometimes um, the mount is more flimsy. Uh, it, is, it, it is a problem, even though you have a very high quality uh, telescope. Another turning point is that, you know, after playing with the DSLR for a few years, I thought, Okay, well, it seems like I'm 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 reaching a plateau uh, in in my in the quality of the picture I, I'm producing. So I decided to save up, right? You have to save up money for this hobby, and to get a, a color one shot uh, camera. People call this OSC. In short, it is a one shot color camera. It is a dedicated astro camera. Uh, this one is a cooling camera as well. Um, as you probably know, um, everything that uses electronics or electricity will produce uh, electrical noises. And just like our CCD camera, the CCD camera uses uh, electronics and there will be uh, electrical noises. And um, the hotter, the, the warmer the temperature, the higher, the more electrical noises are being produced. That's why uh, for astro camera, for deep sky photography, you want to cool down your camera to maybe sub-zero temperature to try to minimize the amount of noise. Think about it, the less noise you have in your background, the better quality image you will get. 
And then a few years later, I move on to a mono camera with filters. That would be another step of upgrade. There are frustration moments in my uh, astrophotography journey. Uh, first of all, not enough sleep. Uh, I'm sure you know if you do astrophotography, you totally understand. Like lacking of sleep is is painful. But when you do this for hobby, when you just do this for 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 your fun and for your hobby, it works. And uh, sometimes you expect to get something like that, and and you realize your subs your subs means your your photographs are really really bad. And you, you waste the whole night time, you waste your sleeping time. But also, as I mentioned, it is a very lonely hobby, right? Yeah, your parents may think this is what you're doing. Your friends may be thinking this is what you're doing. And um, <laughs> your, 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 your friend, your most common people think actual photographer are doing something like really, really cool. But actually it is a very lonely hobby. You know, you take all the subs and then you, you stay, sit in front of the computer for hours and hours. And, and sometimes you just dump the whole data. It's not useful. You have to try again. So, uh, yeah. And there are moments that I, I wanted to give up. There are so many consecutive, consecutive months that I, I didn't want to image at all. And I almost, I, I'm glad that I did not do that. I almost sell off all my gears. I was saying, like, forget it. <laughs> like, I don't want to do it anymore. But um, I did not give up, and uh, so and then I realized that hey, this is the the key of the hobby. You can't just give up, and if you want to do well, you, you can just improve on it. And uh, so uh, and I found a lot of peers that can help me uh, uh, support each other. This is so important. Uh, you want to do this yourself, as I said, this is a lonely hobby. Not even my wife understands what I'm talking about when I share with her about. Um, exposures, about guiding, about, you know, camera I'm thinking to get, or about all these technical terminologies. She was just like, mm-hmm, uh-huh. And no one knows what you're talking about. So it is a lonely hobby, but uh, thanks internet, we can find a lot of support from different social media groups, and we learn from each other a lot. And I'm always inspired by many actual photographers out there and uh, we, we exchange ideas and we uh, share struggles. So another important turning point in my opinion is you have to have a change in your mindset towards this hobby. First, it is just a hobby. Sometimes when you put so much time on it, you, you think that this is your whole life. It is your, your entire personality. No, it is just a hobby. You can do well on it. You may not do well on it at that moment, but you can. Just believe the fact that you can always improve over time, your own pace. And your own pace is very important, right? Uh, we all have different financial situations. We all have different uh, needs from our family, personally, from my work. And um, you can only do what you can do when you have time and only with what you have. Of course, if you are able to save up a little bit more money to upgrade your gears, by all means, go for it. But we have to do this at our own pace. There's no competition in astral photography, really. You compete to yourself because this is just uh, a hobby that you always compare to yourself. And uh, I live in a light polluted city, as you, as I mentioned. So this is Orion. I'm not sure if you can see Orion beside my the tree in my backyard. This is like south facing tree. So I, I couldn't see anything in the southern direction from my backyard. Anyway, south to my direction is metropolitan Toronto. There's nothing you can see in the sky from Toronto sky. But this Orion, it is so dim. Um, light pollution is really, really bad. But there are solutions to fight light pollution. So maybe you can try shorter subs, means shorter exposure. Maybe you can take photos later in the night. Okay, take advantage of the uh, astronomical twilight. And practice processing skills is also important. As long as you don't give up, just keep processing, processing. I found that processing is, is, is like painting. It's an art. You have to keep practice on it. And then you will find out how to um, make not so good picture into better pictures. And, uh, or if you want, you can just focus on penetrative imaging. Uh, some of my friends live in downtown Toronto. Even, even narrow band imaging, yeah, you can do that in, in the city. Um, 
that they just focus on planetary imaging. Okay, you can try using light pollution filters, depends on how bad the light pollution is. Um, light pollution filters do not work with LED light, unfortunately. So if, you're, if the street light is the white LED light, uh, doesn't help much. It may help a little bit, but don't expect the light pollution filters can help you screen out LED light. And narrow band imaging will be another option. Okay, that means you use special filters uh, to just screen out the, the hydrogen alpha and oxygen uh, three uh, spectrum to compose uh, photos. And I will show you some of my sample photos in a moment. So, uh, scopes that I currently have. Uh, I have a used uh, refractor. I have a used edge uh, uh, eight inch uh, cast grain. I have a used uh, LEN60 uh, double stack solar scope. These are all used scope. I found that the, um, the price tag for the new scope is, is actually not quite affordable to me. Um, and uh, this scope is an eight inch uh, Newtonian on the left. I got it for new because it was just like six, seven hundred dollars and it was new. And this, uh, my latest family is a 14 inch sync scan of Solian. It is a big stethoscope. It is so heavy. It's like 100, 180 pounds in total. I can just leave it in my backyard. But it was on sale. It was a big sale and probably because it is in low demand. Like no one wants to get such a scope that heavy. And what about the mount? I have a tracker. Uh, I have a Celestron AVX. I have the Celestron uh, CGM EX uh, mount. So my um, a lot of questions uh, come, came to my attention is, do you really need high-end gears for astrophotography? Um, yes and no. But if you want to start astrophotography, definitely you do not need high-end gears. This photo at the back, in the background, is the planetary alignment just happened this year. You see from Saturn, Jupiter, uh, Mars, Venus, um, uh, and Mercury right here, okay, and the Moon. So Mercury actually is there. Uh, this is my second attempt for this planetary alignment. The second time I finally caught uh, Mercury actually in the frame. The first time there were some clouds there, I, I wasn't able to do it. So I tried uh, like a few weeks later. And so this is just DSLR and a 10 millimeter lens and a tripod. No tracking, no whatsoever. And I use Photoshop to stitch two panels together because the 10 millimeter lens is not really wide enough to cover all the planets. So high-end gears, yes, nice to have, but it's not important. It is not the most important part. Um, so my interest in astrophotography, I have landscape, deep sky, planetary, solar, and I started ISS photography this year. It was very, very interesting. So this is my horse head nebula I wanted to show you here. So 2017, uh, it was like that. I think I have not modified my camera. This is unmodified camera. And then in 2018, I, I kind of modified the camera and you can see the difference. And then um, 2019, 20, and two years later, this is my latest horse head nebula. I'm happy with this result, but um, I can keep adding data to it to, to make it better and better. Uh, this is an, uh, my, uh, the longest project I have to date. I think I spent about 40 plus hours in total uh, in exposure for the squid and flying bat nebula. Uh, this part of the squid is so dim. Um, it took so much time, even with a mono camera, with an oxygen filter, it took me so long because I'm, I was doing this right from my backyard. I did not go to any dark sky. I just did it from my backyard. So it is uh, um, just in a light polluted uh, uh, area. And this is the uh, elephant trunk nebula. Okay. Um, again, it is from my bottle seven or eight uh, backyard from Southern Ontario. This is narrow band imaging. And here is a pinwheel. Uh, I like this one. This is, uh, I, I spent a lot of time like integrating data uh, and polishing the processing and try to make the rims of the galaxy uh, appealing without overblowing the core, with also with details. And also I have the, uh, the velocity, the hydrogen alpha data added to it. This one is just from a tripod and DSLR. Uh, I think I did it last February uh, at the uh, David Dunn Observatory. Um, 
it was cold. It was like minus 15 uh, in the, uh, at around 11 o'clock. So I, I think I brought a battery pack and the battery just get frozen. And I think I only have two and a half hours of star trails over here. So, but it was clear night. So uh, I am happy. I actually printed out on the canvas. Now it is sitting in my living room. Um, this is another, my favorite moment uh, is on the 2019 eclipse. I was like, keep hitting the shutter by hand manually one by one. So I was taking picture like once every seconds every few seconds, and I found that one of the steps, there's a bright spot right here. So um, I think I was one of the few people who, who discovered this bright spot on the subs, and a uh, few hours later, uh, the news, and a few days later, the news were talking about, uh, lots of people actually captured the same thing. During the lunar eclipse, there was a meteorite impact on the lunar surface. So, uh, and I compare my subs, at this time, I didn't see the bright spot. Here, I saw the bright spot, and here, the bright spot is gone. So I actually captured that uh, as well. It was just lucky. Uh, Saturn. So this is my Saturn picture, my latest Saturn picture. Um, you can see the progress, 2016, and then, yeah, now it's better. So, I, I mean, you know, with, with time, Many of you can can actually improve in astral photography. Um, you know, you just need patiently practice on it. Mars, it is from the last opposition last year, actually two years ago. Uh, I got some good details because the sky was pretty clear. And Jupiter, my latest Jupiter, I'm pretty happy about it. But I will try again in the opposition this year in the September 26th. So it is much higher up in the sky. I hope I can have a better seeing condition and uh, get a better capture, ideally with the great red spot in it. Solar imaging is also very important uh, and interesting to me. Uh, so the solar scope, I just put a penetrary camera on it. And uh, with practice, you can actually create something like this. OK, here's an uh, animation with the solar flares coming up from it. Um, ISS. So for those who haven't seen ISS, uh, here's a real time real-time uh, motion, you can see how fast that is actually moving across the sky. So the bright spot in the middle, you see is rising up, rising up, rising up. Um, it is how fast it's actually moving. So I have to manually uh, adjust my Dobsonian telescope, try to focus it using using my, my finder scope and uh, to, to put ISS in the middle of the frame. It is challenging, it is challenging. But uh, with the help of software, whenever you see ISS in, in the in the somewhere in the frame, there are softwares. It's, let's say uh, PIPP is a software. It can help you to center your targets in the frame and put them together. And then you can do some amazing processing. So here is my ISS. I try in May 11 this year. So I try. I mostly spent two months trying that this year. So from the first trial and my latest one in. July 15, I can see a lot more detail. I can even see the SpaceX capsule right there. And uh, so it is cool. It is cool to, to do something like this in your backyard from the city. Um, Comet, uh, just want to share this one here. Uh, it's uh, the famous Comet Neowise uh, two years ago during pandemic. And I went out with my two sons. They were like seven years old, eight years old back in that time. Um, it was phenomenal. You saw the comments like hang up in the sky by naked eyes. And of course, photography can actually review a lot more details of the comments, like the one on the right that I captured. But uh, just visually, it was exciting. Uh, 2017, uh, me and my wife flew down to Kansas City. Uh, we planned to look at the, the solar eclipse, but Kansas City was cloudy, rainy, so I had to hit the road at four o'clock in the morning, drive to Jefferson City. Same in Missouri, but it was a long drive. So this is what I got. You see the shadow is moving from the right to the left. And when the shadow exits, right, so now the shadow is uh, covering the moon, and then the shadow is moving uh, away from it. So it was 
once in a lifetime experience. So I really encourage anyone interested in astronomy, don't give up that chance on April 8th, 2024. It will be a big thing because the totality pathway is so close to us. You can just drive to Buffalo or Niagara Falls to have about three minutes of totality. And uh, it's amazing. Hopefully the weather cooperates. If you really want to make sure that you have a good chance to see it, then you may have to go somewhere uh, in the middle of the state. It will be, the weather forecast will be much more promising. Um, so here's a solar eclipse picture. And uh, yeah, this is another solar eclipse we watched uh, last year in June 10th, 2021. We went down to Wupan Beach. I, I think we woke up at like four o'clock. My whole family went down to Wupan Beach by by 5.30, I believe, by five o'clock. And then we waited and waited and uh, the moon covered the sun and it, it rises up. It was so beautiful. It was so amazing. It was so crowded. There were so many people there. Everybody's trying to look at the, the rise of the solar eclipse. And this year, I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I have the privilege joining the Starfest for the first time. Uh, and this one is not from the Starfest, this is from the Dark Sky Preserve uh, uh, near Kingston, the Land Loss and Eddington Dark Sky uh, for the Milky Way. And uh, here are some of the photos I have from my uh, uh, Starfest journey this year. And it was great. It was so much fun. There's so many people with all sorts of tech so you speak to people, you exchange ideas with people, you just learn a lot from each other. And uh, this is another photo I got from my staff this, this time. And uh, and this one too, this is just an, a very faint nebula and that I wanted to take advantage uh, at the dark sky during uh, the star fest. Um, I want to spend maybe just a few more minutes. I know I already spent about 30 minutes I want to spend just a few more minutes talk about my community connections. Uh, actually, my academic background is astrophysics from uh, University of Toronto. And uh, I actually did my thesis inside this observatory um, um, before, but uh, it, it, was, uh, um, it was the time before, uh, you know, U of T sold it sold out, you know, the, the DDO, the, the observatory. So it was in the late 70s. So those are the, all the telescopes in the uh, DDO uh, observatories. So those are the, in, in, the, in the administration buildings. That's the main scope. And because of my uh, astrophysics background, I actually teach physics uh, in, in high school. So I, I always want to connect my students with space and astronomy because it is my, my interest. So you can see my decoration in my classroom. I have a star war uh, showcasing all my astro uh, astro photos, and here as well. I update my photos from time to time. I bring them to, to field trips and uh, I, I bought my solar telescope and hopefully, you know, they can they can see the sun, uh, you know, for real under the picture on the right. Uh, yeah, it, it is it is it is my passion sharing astronomy and, and, and physics with my students. And uh, sometimes I inspire some of my students um, to be future astrophotographers. And these are some of the photos taken by my high school students. Um, I'm so glad that they, they actually brave enough to give it a try and, uh, and uh, uh, send me back some of the photos they have got uh, on their own. So it is a it's a very rewarding uh, journey sharing that with with public with uh, with my students especially and uh, I have two social medias uh, that I always link with my uh, um, uh, students and um, when I do public outreach you know um, so uh, City Astro Photography Canada is my Instagram and also Benjamin Astro Photography Hub is another uh, social media that I have uh, on Facebook and. Uh, Again, you know, I'm not expert in this, but I think I've gone through a lot of necessarily struggles and steps that a typical astrophotographer will, will go through. So um, if you're interested in this hobby, uh, feel free to add me uh, on the social media. We can learn from each other for sure. And, uh, and, and by learning from each other, I'm sure we can all improve uh, in this amazing hobby. And that's all I prepare for tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Is there any question? Uh, from the audience. 
Benjamin, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, fabulous uh, images of the deep sky, uh, great images, uh, fabulous images of, of, of planetary. And that uh, ISS image was absolutely amazing. I hadn't thank seen you. something like that before. Well done. Thank you. And uh, of course, you spoke many words of wisdom during your presentation about astrophotography as, as a hobby. So well, well done. Um, Emma, do we have any questions for Benjamin? Yes. All right. First question comes in from Ennio Shalucci. How did you stay motivated in the early days? In the early days? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think one of the motivations is that, you know, when you achieve one goal, let's say when you got some photos, um, I know maybe your friends don't don't know how it's done. And and but when you when you share that with your friends, when you share it with your family, um, that could be a motivation that, hey, maybe I can do something better next time, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the stage. You know, it, it is so hard, uh, but also, you know, in terms of fighting for tiredness, uh, I don't know. I still work on the next day, uh, but uh, you know, sometimes, you know, when you love something that what you're doing, you just need to sacrifice. That's, That's a great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this next question comes in from Zapfan Zapfan. Um, did you take the IR filter out of your camera? Uh, my DSLR. Uh, or yeah, so yeah. for my DSLR, uh, I took out the uh, IR UV uh, filter. So that way, um, the hydrogen alpha spectrum, which is around 650, 658 nanometer uh, wavelength, can pass through the can can reach the sensor. Um, of course, ideally, if you if you take out the entire uh, filter, we call this the the, the camera will be naked. Uh, ideally, you probably need some IR filter to to minimize some of the the halo that glows in bright stars. But uh, processing can take 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 care of it. So yes, I I took out the IR uh, UV filter from my camera. Cool. Thank you. Um, from Eric Eric Briggs says Ben, congrats on your work. Um, that you displayed at the Starfest Imaging Contest. What was your okay. favorite shot or animation from there? Um, my favorite shot is actually um, the, the solar eclipse one myself, because I, I think, um, uh, first of all, it to me, like I, 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 I was so stunned by the view when the moon and the sun rises from the horizon. Like not many people see sunrises anyway, but that was actually not a typical sunrise with the moon covering the sun. I think another layer is that I got my family with me and uh, I, I really hope that you know my my kids can also develop interest maybe in science or astronomy in the future. But of course, you know it is their life; they will decide what they do. But I'll try to influence as much as possible. That's why I think that picture to me has has a deeper meaning because my family was with me, uh, witnessed that special moments of the sunrise, and they still remember after two years when I spoke to them. Uh, like, do you remember the sunrise uh, two years ago? They all remember that. So uh, that will be my favorite picture. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Um, Ralph Chu says, great images. Thank you. And, and Yoshilucci also wants to know, for the ISS image with the Dobsonian, did the software handle the telescope not rotating? Uh, no. So for the Dobsonian, I have to unlock all. It is actually manual guiding. Uh, I did not lock uh, any of the the, the knob there so i unscrew all the knobs and so the so the dobsonian is free to move by my hand so i was manually guiding it so uh, again i i took many practice i sometimes i practice using daytime i saw an airplane i try to follow the airplane using my dobsonian of course only when the airplane is not too close to the sun uh imagine the sunlight gets into a 14 inch dobsonian and it gets into my eyes and, and it will be a uh, horrible so I, I follow airplanes for practice but uh after maybe some practice uh, uh you know some of the tricks how to how to get a better chance to have your target inside a view because the camera is very has a very small sensor yeah. and also i have um, um, uh, a three times bottle with it 
So a small sensor camera, three times bottle. <laughs> you can imagine the field of view is extremely, extremely small. So again, it's just, just practice uh, trying to make sure that the USS, when you track, it is still in the frame from time to time. And then uh, by luck, if the atmosphere is good, then uh, you, you, you could get some good photos. Great, thank you so much. That's all our questions for tonight. Okay, great. Thanks again, Benjamin. Uh, let's move to our next speaker, Frank Dempsey, a longtime member, um, has come up uh, with uh, something new that he's working on, a merry-go-round observatory. Go ahead, Frank. All right, I'm not sure if we're having any technical difficulties. We're gonna go to fun facts for a moment and we'll be right back. back. I think we've got Frank back on the line. All right. I, I guess we don't have any audio. I see. I see Frank, but there's no audio. Should we should we go to announcements and then try back Frank in a moment? Okay. So why don't we go ahead with, uh, with Tom and the announcements for this evening, and then when when Tom is done, we'll uh, we'll try Frank again. Tom, you're up. 
All right. Well, good evening, folks. My name is Tom Wooten. I'm the club president, and uh, I'm just going to quickly go through our evening announcements while we uh, resolve these technical issues. So we've got two types of meetings here online on YouTube, our recreational astronomy nights and our speakers nights. And I'm inviting anyone here who's watching this live to uh, please say hi in the YouTube chat. Uh, if you've got any questions for the presenters, uh, let them uh, type them in. Um, if you're a new member, please introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far away, please let us know where you're from. For example, at the moment, I am broadcasting from Coburg, Ontario. So um, coming up at our next speaker's night on the 21st of September, uh, at 7.30 p.m., uh, Julie Tomei from the Royal he's muted. Museum will be... This is, this is one thing that's been going on. Uh, Julie Tomei from the Royal Ontario Museum uh, will be giving a talk entitled, Mom, Can You Do This Every Summer? on being the astronomer in residence at Killarney Provincial Park. Um, join us here live on YouTube. Our next recreational astronomy night uh, is on the 5th of October at 7.30 p.m. Andy Beaton will be discussing the sky this month. Francois Van Heerden will be test driving the TubeTech 20 megapixel TEC camera. And Jason Dane will be discussing uh, my astrophotography journey. Uh, if you'd like to present something yourself, please contact Paul Markov. Coming up to DDO in the next little while, uh, on Friday, September the 9th at 8 p.m., Leo uh, Alcorn will be discussing Blowing Bubbles in Plasma, Galactic Fountains at the Centers of Galaxy Clusters. Uh, there's a $12.76 registration fee. Links to the registration can be found at rasco.ca. Uh, coming up on Sunday, September the 11th, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. is Sunday Sun Gazing, 6 dollars uh, registration fee. Again, the links are at rasco.ca. And then on Friday, September the 16th, 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. is DDO Up in the Sky. Uh, registration fee of $12.76. Uh, links, again, at rasco.ca. Now, uh, we've reopened our public outreach as of the 1st of April, and we recommend that volunteers and visitors wear masks. We recommend telescope operators disinfect their eyepieces, their focus knobs, and any other touch points, like a step ladder with a 70% rubbing alcohol following each visitor. Uh, we require visitors to disinfect their hands before touching any information booth literature. And when deciding whether to participate in outdoor events, we're asking that all members consider their personal health and comfort first. And so on that note, our next Millennium Square public stargazing event is on Friday, September 30th, 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Join us and our sponsor, Durham Skies, for an evening of free public stargazing along the north shore of Lake Ontario Millennium Square. Uh, just a reminder that it is cooler down by the lake, uh, so dress appropriately. Uh, please check out the website for our go, no-go decision based on the weather before heading out. City observing sessions, uh, City Star Party at Bayview Village Park. So far, we haven't had any luck this week, so there's still one more attempt, which is tomorrow night, if it's clear. Uh, check the website for Go, No Go. And um, otherwise, our next City Star Party is going to be the first clear night of the week of October 3rd to 6th. Uh, the CAO, our club observatory out near Blue Mountain, access the CAO facilities by members and families only in a modified communal fashion with total site occupancy limited to 25 individuals. The upstairs washroom is only for upstairs bookings. Uh, maximum occupancy for the upstairs bedrooms is two people from the same family per bedroom for a total of six people. Communal areas are limited to three people with masks. All CAO users can use both kitchens, the downstairs washroom with mask. Uh, full details on the website. Please read everything before making your bookings. Uh, we're still looking for volunteers for a whole bunch of different things. We're looking for a light pollution committee chair. We're looking for volunteer committee chair. We're looking for a marketing committee chair as well as committee members. The AV committee, the wonderful folks who work so hard to put on the show for you, are always looking for additional help. Education Public Outreach is always looking for additional help. For example, helping out at the Millennium Square Star Parties. 
And as well, for some of our virtual star parties, we are looking for telescope camera operators. Um, reminder that if you'd like to volunteer, you must be a RASC Toronto Centre member. Please contact myself at president at rasco.ca. Brief plug here for the RASC membership. If you'd like to uh, renew or subscribe, you can do so at secure.rasc.ca. There is a RASC emergency fund available if you're a longtime member and uh, economic situation has changed. It's confidential. Uh, for more details or to purchase a gift membership for someone else, please contact mempub at rask.ca. And that's it for the announcements for the evening. Uh, just a reminder to please follow us on all forms of social media. Um, and with that, um, I think we'll head back to our presentations.